any further, I do want us to open in prayer. Because, <laughs> boy, do I need it. <laughs> okay, so if y'all will pray with me, I'd appreciate it. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, God, you are the most high God, the Holy One of Israel. And yet you love us so much. God, I pray that you will open our eyes so that we can learn more of you through your scripture. Let us, Lord, realize that this is the Holy Bible because this is truth and this is your word. God, I pray for these women who are coming to study your word today. Let them hear what you would have them hear and then let them live it in their, in their lives through the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay. Oh, look! I'm so excited. Look at that. April got that for us. These are all the scriptures. I wanted to show Tim Mackey and it's how to read the Bible. This is fantastic if you can go. Oh, and here's what I want to tell you. Right now, media has this, and any church member who wants to uh, resource this stuff, all you have to do is just give JD a, um, a current email address, and you can watch any of this. You, there's Kay Arthur. I mean, she had 140-plus uh 27-minute videos on Isaiah. So you, there's tremendous resources for you available on Right Now Media, and all you have to do to get access to that is just holler at JD and say, I'd like to get that, and he'll get you signed up. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. In the year that Bobby Kennedy died, that summer, I went with our church choir, our youth choir, on a mission trip to Marfa, Texas. And as you'll hear, I thought I knew better than our mu music minister, and that's Ed Whitner. You see him right there next to me. Great guy. Bless his heart. We were in a church service uh, on a Sunday night in Marfa, and 40 or 50 of us. It was a good youth choir, and I was a part of that, and we were singing um, our song, and everything was going just great. We were all following Ed's direction. We loved him, but somewhere after that first verse, things kind of went wrong. While the rest of the choir was singing, and following Ed's direction, his expert professional direction, I thought that we should be singing another verse. And so, even though he had the sheet music right in front of him, and he knew exactly what was happening, um, I thought maybe, well, he's turned two pages at one time, and I'm going to help him and the choir get on to the right verse. So I began to sing this other verse as the rest of the choir was singing the real verse, the verse that Ed was leading. And with my strong voice, that's a good thing, but in this instance, maybe not so much. Uh, I actually convinced people who were around me to start singing with me on the wrong verse. So you can imagine how crazy this was, where you had two different verses going at the same time. And eventually, Ed just had to stop <laughs> the choir, and we had to start completely over. Well, talk about disharmony, musical chaos, this was it. But... Ed managed to get us back, and we, I was quiet after that, as you can imagine. Uh, and, of course, I was mortified when I realized what I was doing. I thought I was helping, but that's not really a help, is it? Uh, I was not following directions. I really just was kind of hoping that the ground would open up in Marfa, Texas, and I'd fall down and be smacked 
end to that. But that didn't happen either. I, I just don't know what I was thinking on that day. Um, but Ed was so gracious. He was forgiving. He was gracious to me, as were uh, the other members of the choir eventually. <laughs> And that story of who's really leading, who are you following? Let's go then now to Isaiah and take a look at what's happening there. In Isaiah's time, he's this prophet that we're going to be studying about. The people had rejected the direction of their God. These were, the, these were the people that God had chosen back in Exodus long ago with Moses. God had said, you're going to be my people and I'm going to be your God. That's in Exodus 6, 7. And so they had this covenant relationship that God had promised to protect them, take care of them, provide for them. And he was going to be their God. And they were supposed to follow these laws that God had given to Moses, handed down so that they would know how to live their lives and how to, um, when they did sin, as we all do, that they would know how to do the sacrifices and have a substitutionary sacrifice. That's a big word, isn't it? But it essentially means instead of them having to die because of their sin, they would bring a sheep and they would cut its throat and so on. So God had that process uh, in store and had it in place, rather, for the people of Israel. Well, by this time, now that's hundreds of years ago. It's probably about 300 years or more since David was the king. So this is around the middle of the 700s that Isaiah comes along. The people are doing well. They, things are going fine. And the people are practicing religion with a false heart. They have wrong motives. They're taking their sacrifices to church on Sunday well, maybe to the temple on Saturday, but it doesn't mean anything to them at all. They're not following God's direction. So Isaiah says, come, God says through Isaiah, I beg your pardon, come and let us reason together. Now this one I thought was interesting because I thought, well, how can I reason with God? If I'm not, my, it's not an equal meeting of the minds, is it? It couldn't possibly be. It says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts, God's talking here, are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This come let us reason together that's so popular you see it out there in the world. What that actually means is more the concept of, come on, Pat, think about this. Use your brain and work here. There is that small sense of the judicial court thing of arguing before a court, but it has nothing to do with God and you being on the same plane. When God says to us, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Do you see? We sin, but yet, and God requires judgment for that. And the payment for sin is death, as we know in Romans. But yet, at the same time, God is saying, yes, my holiness requires judgment. But at the same time, he's saying, my love brings you salvation. I have a plan that will cover your sins. And that is the Messiah, isn't it? That is the Messiah. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Praise God that he has. So, I want to ask you today, whose lead are you following? Who's the director of your life? Are you musical chaos? Oh, I forgot to show you. 
Sorry, I didn't mean to have it on there so long. This is the Isaiah scroll. Uh, Who are you following? Are you following yourself and all of the chaos that comes from that? Are you following the one, the Holy One of Israel? Let me encourage you to do that. One of the things I'd like for you to do this week is ask the Lord to show you your sin as he sees it so that we will not try to just dismiss these things as just a mistake or that's really not that big a deal. Let's see it as God sees it, and then we can confess our sin and repent of sin and turn back to him and be restored to that right relationship with him. So who's leading the song of your life? Who's your director? I pray it's God's. All right, let's have a prayer, and then you'll go to your classrooms. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have sent Jesus Christ to be our substitute, to pay that price for sin. Thank you, O Lord, that we have new life in you as a result. Lord, let us take it serious. Let us realize that this is the life you've given us and live it for you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.